Kissing Tulips, Part 4 I am awoken early the next morning by a shrill scream coming from down the hall. Hearing the thudding footsteps of the others in the house making their way towards the sound, I jump from my bed and make for the door. My heart is pounding madly in my chest as I reach Marianne's room, but Martha is there and grabs my shoulders before I have a chance to enter. No, miss, you mustn't go in. You mustn't see, she whispers urgently. See what? What has happened, Martha? I try to break free of her grasp, but her hold on me is firm. Your sister... She trails off, and suddenly I know. I can hear my mother sobbing from inside the room, and the rest of the servants who have come to peer in merely turn away sadly. No, please, not Marianne. He promised. But I can see through the open door now. And when I look, I wish I hadn't. Marianne is lying on her bed. The blankets have tangled themselves around her lower waist. And even from out here, I can see the whiteness of her skin. There is a streak of crimson at her throat, which runs down her shoulder to stain the bedclothes. My eyes blur with tears. And through them, the pattern of my sister's blood looks like a bouquet of tulips. The funeral for Mary Ann in the days that followed was cold and rainy, but half of the town still turned up anyway. I did not hear a word the preacher said over my sister's grave, nor the condolences from those people who had shown up. All I could do was stare at the cream-coloured coffin as the gravediggers slowly tossed dirt over it. My mind felt heavy with guilt, and I couldn't shake the thought that this whole ordeal was my fault. From somewhere behind me, I heard Mother call me to come away and let the men finish their work. I pretend not to hear. Finally, father succeeds in dragging mother away, saying that I would be along when I was ready. Well, I wasn't ready to leave. Not yet. Not ever. How could I, when my sister lay cold in the ground, and I would never hold her, never laugh with her, never talk to her again? The rain began to come down harder, my bonnet was beginning to soak through, but I didn't care. My face felt wet, and I knew I was crying, but pretended it was only the rain. I'm not sure how long I stood there weeping, but just then, a shadow of an umbrella over my head caused me to turn and see the Baron standing behind me. He wore a suit of coal black, and I couldn't help but notice that his gloves and cravat were the same colour as my sister's coffin. He gazed directly into my eyes, and for the briefest of moments, I wanted to fall into his arms like a child, but something else held me back. All of my grief and guilt suddenly crystallised into anger so sharp that I came to life with it. Opening my mouth, I said the first words that came to my brain. I'm afraid I must break off our engagement, sir. There will be no need for you to see me, or for I to see you, from this moment on. His eyes grew wide in surprise, but he regained his composure quickly. I'm sure I don't understand you, Miss Lydia. Surely you don't mean to say that you would break off our plans to be married because of this tragedy. Your sister would have wanted to see you happy. How dare he? What my sister would have wanted for me, sir, is none of your affair. But while we are on the subject, I feel inclined to remind you that our bargain was sealed on the promise that my sister would live. And as you can clearly see, that isn't the case. Good day to you. 
I turned to go, but he reached out and grasped my wrist, hard, hard enough that I winced. I don't think you quite understand the gravity with which you promised me. Trust me when I say that I am not a man to be toyed with, and if I cannot have what I want, I am not adverse to taking it by force. A strange light had come into his eyes, which frightened me, but I held my ground and spoke as calmly as I could. Let go of me, sir. He did, and I turned away. Running quickly down the slope, I could hear him call after me. His voice was like the wind, bitterly cold and harsh. You will regret this, Lydia, he called. Don't you think I won't make you regret it? I quickened my pace and didn't stop to turn round until I had reached the safety of my own house. The household passed the rest of the day in gloomy silence, which I am grateful for. I didn't want to talk to anyone. The only thing I really wanted was to be comforted by my mother and father. But mother locked herself in her room, and father is in the study. He has taken out a bottle of brandy, preferring to drink his sorrow away. In a matter of hours he will be drunk, and hopefully forget today's endeavour. Feeling wretched, I climb the stairs and make for my room, but inside I find more pain than comfort. Everything that Marianne owned, her brushes, combs and perfumes, are still in the vanity where she left them. Her wardrobe is still full of beautiful dresses. Who will wear them now? I imagine I see her at the vanity mirror, checking herself and making faces before turning round to smile at me. But it's just a memory. It isn't real. I should be preparing to sleep, but I don't feel tired. I need to get out of this house. The emptiness of the room feels like a great gaping hole. Furiously, I throw open my own wardrobe and select a simple brown travelling cloak from the inside. Father has the right idea, and soon I won't be able to feel at all either. The Nag's Head is a quaint little pub to be sure, even if it is on the side of town that is known for its vagrants and whorehouses. Mother would faint dead away if she knew I was here. But as Marianne and I used to come here with Liam all the time, I have no need to worry. The pub is small and dark, easy to hide in. On principle, no woman of upper-class birth would ever be caught lurking here, and I notice the bartender raise an eyebrow at me when I slide my money across the table. He notices my delicate white gloves, too fine to be from this end of town, but I know he won't press me. After all, money is still money, whether it is coming from a woman of my standing or the lowliest of creatures. He hands me my drink, and I retreat to a corner with it, anxious to be alone. The first sip burns my throat, but I know a few more and I'll be accustomed to it. I am sitting by the fire, and am slumped as far as my corset will allow, and let the heat warm my body. Without meaning to, my mind wanders to Liam, and how Marianne and I would sometimes spend our nights here, drinking, until we were giddy and could barely stand. My heart aches as I think of both of them, lying in the cemetery dead, and no doubt attracting all sorts of vermin who will break into their coffins and gnaw away at their bones. The thought sickens me, and I turn my attention to my drink once more. This time, the Baron comes to my mind, and I can feel the white-hot anger that wells up from my stomach 
as I take another sip of my drink to contain it. I want to make him pay for making me promise to wed him when he knew full well that he couldn't cure Marianne. For all I know, that packet he had given me had contained poison, and I had given it to her. Forgive me, Anne, I plead, and take another swig of my drink. It tastes bitter, like my tears. Are you all right, miss? Says a soft voice at my elbow, and I nearly jump out of my seat in fright. I turn and see a tall gentleman in a long, dark brown coat. His face is hidden under a hat that is pulled down over his eyes, but in the glow of the firelight, I catch the contours of strong cheekbones and an angular face. You startled me, sir. I did not hear you approach. And I do apologize for that, miss. I just saw you over there from across the room and thought you looked a bit out of place. Are you sure a girl like yourself should be huddled here in this pub where it is so very dangerous at night? I have a right to go where I like, same as you, and you'll forgive me for saying so, sir, but I don't know you and would kindly appreciate it if you left me alone. I realize I am raving and have no right to be angry with this man. But my drink has made me bold, and I feel like hurting someone. He raises his hands in defense, as if to ward off my anger, but does not go away. I did not wish to offend you, miss. Please allow me to try again. I did see you over there, and thought you looked out of sorts. But I also couldn't help but notice that you were crying a moment before. Tell me, what is it that has made you so sad? Something about his voice is familiar, and I feel myself relax. Forgive me, sir. I have been awfully rude to you, and for that I do apologize. But you see, I have lost something very dear to me. And I'm sick to death with the pain of it. He sits without asking, and even though I can't see his face clearly, I have the sensation that he is looking a question at me. What sort of loss have you suffered, if I may ask? I swallow hard past the lump in my throat, then answer, My sister. His form becomes rigid as he replies, I am truly sorry for your loss. You are kind, I say, and once again take a sip from my tankard. How did it happen? He asks, and for whatever reason I cannot fathom, I proceed to tell him the whole tale, leaving out nothing and only stopping here and there to drink. I have no idea why I am pouring my soul out to a perfect stranger, but I feel compelled to tell somebody, lest my pain rip me in two. When I finally stop, he is staring fixedly at me, and the energy around us seems to pulse. Or maybe I am just drunk. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I remember something. Something Mary Ann said to me the night before she died. If I die... He must promise to make sure I stay dead. I don't know why I remembered this so suddenly, but I feel that there is somewhere else I should be. Something important I ought to be doing. I rise from my chair and nearly topple over. Oh yes, I am very drunk. I don't really know why I told you everything just now. I admit to my silent stranger. Thank you for listening to me and comforting me when I needed it most. I fear I have to go now, though. Good night to you, sir, and thank you again. I turn to go, but he stops me with a light touch on my wrist. Wait, he says softly. 
Before you go anywhere tonight, please take this with you. And from the inside of his coat, he pulls out a wooden rosary and hands it to me. A rosary? I ask, hiccuping a laugh. Do you think I will meet the devil on my way home? You never know who you might meet on a night like this, he says, and gently lays the rosary in my open hand, brushing the top of my palm delicately with the soft tips of his gloved fingers. The edges of my brain, which were becoming fuzzy with drink before this, suddenly come into sharp focus when, when he touches me. I think I lean forward to try and get a better look at his face, but he's already on his feet and gliding away from me as silently as he had come. I bundle up once more and, walking as straight as I can manage, make my way out of the pub.